Let's open our Bibles this morning to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. You know, not all sinners look like the homeless man in this video. The fact is that a person can be a respectable religious person and be as spiritually homeless as that man is physically homeless. You realize that millions of people are sitting in churches today and they think because they have, they're in church and they've been going to church and maybe they've given an offering and perhaps they've even been baptized, they think that that is all that God requires of them. And yet what they don't realize is that you can be just as far from God sitting in a church pew as you are if you're sitting on a bar stool. But the good news is that Jesus loves all of us. No matter whether we're rebellious sinners or religious sinners and everything in between, he loves us all. And that's why Jesus came. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15 says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And it doesn't matter what kind of sinner we are. The fact is that we are all far from God. And, uh, and so this morning, I, just, I want us to think together about what would Jesus say if he were to walk into a church and speak to a religious person who is far from God, a person who has counted on the fact that they've come to church and been a part of religious activities and thinking that's all it requires, what would Jesus say to you? Well, we have here recorded in John chapter 3 a conversation that Jesus had with a very, very religious man. In fact, we might say he was a wonderful church-going man but he's still very far from God. This is one of the the most... uh, extensive and and better known conversations of Jesus recorded in the New Testament. We have it picking up in chapter 3 and verse 1 where Jesus has this talk with a man named Nicodemus. Follow along as I read. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miracles that you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The great commentator Warren Wisby in his commentary on the book of John tells of an incident that happened in the life of a, the Revolutionary War patriot, Benjamin Franklin. Franklin was uh, so well known as a statesman as, and, uh, and, and as an inventor. And as being as famous as he was, he received letters from people from, from all over the world. But probably no letter was more important than a letter he received from the famous British, uh, the famous preacher of the mid-1700s, of Gant, a guy by the name of, uh, of Whitfield. And uh, Whitfield wrote this long letter to, uh, uh, to Benjamin Franklin, and he said this, I find that you grow more and more famous in the learned world. As you have made such progress in investigating the mysteries of electricity, I now humbly urge you to give diligent heed to the mystery of the new birth. It is a most important and interesting study, and when mastered, will richly repay you for your pains. Well, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to give diligent heed this morning to the mystery of the new birth. 
Now, knowing what Jesus knew about Pharisees, he still takes time with Nicodemus. Knowing that most of the Pharisees were fiercely opposed to him, Jesus still took time with him. The fact is that, uh, that Jesus was very straightforward and honest with Nicodemus, but he was also respectful of him. Jesus wasn't intimidated by the questions that Nicodemus asked. We find at least three different questions that Nicodemus asked. And always Jesus replies, truly, truly, I say to you, I tell you the truth. You see, we can learn so much from the way Jesus approached people who were far from God. And that's part of our motivation in this series called Jesus, Friend of Sinners. I'm I'm praying that God will help us to capture the heart of our Savior Jesus for people who are far from God. doesn't matter whether they're religious or or rebellious. And, uh, And so we're told that this man named Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Now, as a Pharisee, he would have been one of those who lived by the strictest moral and religious code. And as such, he would often be judgmental of people who didn't live as righteously as, as he lived. The fact is that not all, not all Pharisees were hypocrites, but most of them believed that God was truly impressed with just how good they were living their lives. And yet he was going to be surprised one day when uh, he met Jesus, and Jesus shattered all of those illusions. As a member of the the ruling council, as it's called. He was, uh, he was a very highly respected man as a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, the next verse tells us that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, verse 2. Now, it may be that, Jesus, uh, that Nicodemus came to Jesus that night because he was a Pharisee. And if his friends knew that he was associating with this Jesus, whom most of them hated and were opposed to. If they knew that, G- that Nicodemus was hanging out with, 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 uh, with Jesus, then uh, he would have come under fire, maybe even been kicked out of the synagogue. Or it may be that Nicodemus came to Jesus that night because he, he really had some sincere questions that he needed to discuss with Jesus. And uh, the daytime of Jesus' life was so packed, maybe it was at night that, that he would have had the most time to, to answer Nicodemus' questions. But whatever the case, we're told in verse 2 that he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. So Jesus knew, uh, Nicodemus knew enough about Jesus to know that he was a, he had lived an extraordinary life. The fact that his miracles now were widely reported made everyone believe that this man really is a supernatural person, that God is with him. And and really religious people like Nicodemus also expected that the kingdom of God was going to come. And that uh, as as fiercely religious people as they were, they they would be among the first that are welcome into the kingdom of God. And you can imagine how how Nicodemus must have felt when Jesus shattered that illusion with one simple statement. He said in verse 3, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, I'm going to be using this phrase, born again, the phrase new birth, over and over this morning. And so perhaps I should just go ahead and define it for us right now. So if you want to just jot this down in your sermon notes, this is what the new birth is. The new birth is the act of God. That is, you can't do it yourself. It's something that God alone does. It is the act of God in which he imparts eternal life to those who are spiritually dead. We're spiritually dead and lost due to our sins making them children of God, a part of the family of God and the kingdom of God. And this is what this highly religious man needed in his life. And so Jesus talks to him, first of all, about the necessity of the new birth, the necessity of the new birth. He says in verse 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. It's necessary to be born again. To, To see the kingdom of God essentially means to be saved. It's it's being part of the family of God. 
And for that to happen, one has to be born again. And many people like Nicodemus are very, very religious, but they're very, very far from God and spiritually dead. In fact, the Bible tells us that is true of all of us apart from Christ. Ephesians 2 and verse 1 says, you were dead in your trespasses, in your transgressions and sins. You're not just in trouble. You're dead apart from Christ. You're not just struggling to keep your head above water. You're dead spiritually apart from Christ. You know, when I was a seminary student and a young pastor, I did a little part-time work for a local funeral home in Wichita Falls, helping out with funerals. And as such, I got to see the inner workings of the funeral business and probably learned more than I wanted to know. Um, And so one of the things I learned is that the one way that a a funeral director will try to comfort a family is to to prepare their their loved one's body, the deceased person's body, uh, to, to make them look like they did before they died. And so, if it was a woman, they would find a woman's favorite dress and put it on her. If a man, his favorite suit. They would put makeup on the face so that uh, it, it covered up the fact that, that there was no color in the face. And all of this was to, 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 to minimize the shock of seeing your loved one in a casket. Well, religion without Christ is like putting clothes and makeup on a corpse. It, uh, it makes them appear to be alive even if they're sleeping when really they are dead. Nicodemus was very religious but still very far from God and spiritually dead and going to church no matter how many times you go to church and, and whatever else you do might give you a new start but you don't need a new start, you need a new life. Jesus talks about the necessity of the new life, but he also talks about the possibility of the new birth. It is possible. Now, this is puzzling to Nicodemus, as you see in verse 4. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Now, this is strange terminology for Nicodemus. If you just put yourself in his shoes and Jesus talks about a man being born again, he, he has in his mind the picture of what happens when a, when a person is born. And then he begins, it, it's just he's thinking very physically and literally not spiritually. And we're reminded of the fact that the natural man can't understand the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. You need the help of the Holy Spirit to understand these things. And so Nicodemus is looking at this, this analogy Jesus is using, this, this teaching, is, it just doesn't make sense. How in the world can a grown man be born all over again? Well, Jesus gives him the same answer, but he adds a little more explanation to it. Look at verse 5. He said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Now, it's possible, but it's, it's not possible in your own strength. If you go out here to DFW Airport and want to get on an airplane to fly somewhere, you go to security there, you better make sure you have a boarding pass. If you don't have the boarding pass, um, you're not getting in. I mean, you can look through security in some places at DFW, and you can see an airplane right there. It's that close, but it may as well be a million miles away if you don't have a boarding pass. The same thing is true with us spiritually. And, uh, and, and so we must be born again. It's, impossible. it's possible to enter the kingdom of God, but not in your own strength. You can't cause yourself to be born again any more than you can cause yourself to be born physically the first time. It was an act of someone else. And the new birth is an act of God. Now, what does it mean here when it says in verse 5 to be born of water and the Spirit? Now, you New Testament students at Southwestern Seminary will, will, will really go to town on this because you know that scholars debate this all the time. What does it mean? Well, I, I think the simplest and straightforward, most straightforward meaning here just comes straight out of the context. I believe he's talking here about to be born of water means to be physically born. As you're born, you come through your your mommy's amniotic fluid, her water. 
To be born of water. To be born of the Spirit is to be born again through the power of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell within you when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And so in physical birth, you come out of your mother. In spiritual birth, the Holy Spirit comes into you. Now, Jesus goes on and explains it more in verses 6 and 7. When he says there, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. That's what he's talking about, born of the water, born of the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So here's what we know to this point about Nicodemus. That it requires more than just being devout and being religious. As we've said over and over again, you can be the the most religious person in the world and still be very, very far from God. It's more than just being devout. You don't need more religion. You need a new life. It's more than just having respect for Jesus. Nicodemus respected Jesus. He approaches him in a very respectful way and acknowledges that he is a wonderful teacher. It's more than just being amused at the supernatural. Nicodemus could could see the miracles that Jesus had performed. It's not enough to see the miracles, to see the supernatural. You must experience the supernatural. You must be born again. It's not enough to, to have head knowledge about Jesus. People like Nicodemus know all about Jesus. They know what he has done. They know, they know what he has taught, but it isn't enough. You must be born again. And if Jesus were to stand here among us today and say to church-going people, have you been born again? Now, the good news is that that kind of transformation is not only necessary, but it's possible. It's possible through Jesus Christ. And then Jesus goes on to talk about a third thing with Nicodemus here, and that is the the mystery of the new birth. The mystery of the new birth. He says in verse 8, that the the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, you may have seen golfers uh, from time to time as they're getting ready to hit a shot. They want to know which direction the wind is blowing and and, and how it will affect the flight of their, their golf ball. And so you'll see them reach down and pick up a few sprigs of grass and throw it into the air and then watch. They can't see the wind. They don't know where the wind is, but they can see the effects of the wind on those blades of grass. And Jesus says, "That's, that's the way it is. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of it. You don't know where it comes from or where it's going, but you can see what it moves And people might not understand all of the activity of God in your life, but I'm going to tell you something. They can see the difference in your life and in my life. They may not be able to comprehend everything, but they can see that there's a difference. And this was a mystery to Nicodemus. And Jesus wanted him to understand that when you are born of the Spirit, it's not something that's just invisible, that it will show up in the way you live your life. He said, this is, this is the way it is for everyone who is born of the Spirit. You may not be able to explain it, but you can sure see the difference. Uh, this past weekend, I, I had the privilege of speaking at a missions conference at the International Mission Board Training Center just outside of Richmond. And I was walking through the cafeteria, and I noticed that hanging on the wall was a framed, handwritten letter. And I was drawn to it. And I looked at the letter, and I saw at the bottom it was signed by Karen Watson. And I thought, wait a minute, I know that name. And then I began to recollect her story. Karen Watson, back in 2003, felt God calling her to go to Iraq as an International Mission Board humanitarian worker. And so before she left, she wrote this letter to her pastors in her home church in California, only to be opened in the event of her death. Well, just almost exactly a year later, Karen and four of her colleagues were in a, were in a vehicle in Mosul, Iraq. 
when they, their car was ambushed by the Taliban. Karen was killed along with uh, two of her colleagues and a third, a, an act, a third one was a, a man that uh, we know here at our church. His name was David McDonald. And some of you remember David and Carrie. Carrie was also in the car, his wife, and she was so severely injured that she only survived after months of hospitalization and repeated surgeries. So these four precious souls died. Karen, Larry, Jean, and David. We remember David and, uh, David and Nikki. They were a part of our church, or Carrie. She was sometimes called Nikki or Carrie. Before they left for Iraq, we had prayer for them right here at the altar of our church. But Karen's story is an amazing story. Before she left, though, she wrote this letter to her pastors, and I want you to just hear what she said. She said, you should only be opening this letter in the event of my death. When God calls, there are no regrets. I tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I wasn't called to a place. I was called to him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory, my reward. His glory, my reward. She goes on to quote a, something called the missionary heart that says, care more than some think is wise. Risk more than some think is safe. Dream more than some think is practical. Expect more than some think is possible. And now you think about that life, and it's a mystery how anyone could live with that kind of devotion to Jesus Christ. It is a mystery. The only explanation is that she has experienced something supernatural in her life that will allow her to go into a dangerous area called not to a place, but called to follow Christ. It's a mystery, but it's what happens when a person is born again. But Nicodemus is puzzled by all of this, and so he asks a question in verse 9. He says, how can this be? That's a great question. How can this be? It is a question that has to be answered. And so Jesus goes on to show him the fourth thing, and that is the reality of the new birth. The reality of the new birth. This new birth can become a reality when we believe in Jesus it becomes ours when Jesus comes to live within us. It comes connected with the life of Jesus Christ in us. Now let's jump down to verse 15, where Jesus said that everyone who believes in him, speaking of himself, may have eternal life. Everyone who believes. We need more than religion. We need more than just to go to church. We have to have that vital faith and confidence and dependence upon Jesus Christ. Why? Well, Jesus would go on to explain it, three reasons why we need Christ. Number one, because we are perishing. We are perishing. It's another way to say we are lost, separated from God. Eternal death is, is our destiny apart from Christ. And perhaps one of the best known verses in all of the Bible is John 3, 16. And maybe you didn't realize that it comes in the context of this conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus where he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have this eternal life, everlasting life. We are not only are perishing but also we are condemned that means that we've been judged guilty by a holy God for our sin. But Jesus said in John 3, 18, again, in the context of this conversation with Nicodemus, whoever believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the one and only Son. So you have to believe. Put your trust in Jesus. Not only that, we are under wrath, the Bible says. We're under wrath. You see, God is a holy God and a just God. And what kind of holy God would he be if he didn't have a hatred for everything 
that is evil and sinful. And so we're under the wrath of God. John 3, 36, again, in the context of this conversation with Nicodemus, he says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. You know, Nicodemus was such a fiercely religious man, seriously religious man. And you would look at him and think, if there's anyone in this world that's going to heaven, it's got to be Nicodemus. Jesus said, no, that won't cut it. You must be born again. Now, I know that whenever I preach a message like this, that that some of you are asking this question, well, pastor, how do I know for sure if I've been born again? It's a good question, and I want to answer it by asking you two or three questions. Number one, Has there ever been a time in your life when you heard a message like this, you heard the gospel, and you consciously surrendered all that you know of yourself to all that you know of God, repenting of your sins, putting your past behind you, turning to Christ and trusting in him? Was there ever a time when you consciously surrendered to him in that way? The second question. Do you have the witness of the Holy Spirit in you that you are a child of God? You see, the Bible says that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit will bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, we may not always feel saved. And we all have dry periods in our life where we wonder about our relationship with God. But sooner or later, there's going to be a time when we realize and we know that that God is our Father and Jesus, that we're united with him and he is our Lord and Savior, we're connected to him, the Spirit will bear witness with our spirit. Have you ever experienced that? A third question. Has there ever been a change, a real change in your life? Now, I realize that if you were saved as a, as a boy or a girl or a young teenager, your, your, your new life in Christ probably didn't mean a real dramatic turnaround for you because you hadn't really had a chance to get into too much trouble. But I will just say this, that over time, eventually, you and others will know that there's a difference in the way you think and speak and act. Is there a change? Has there a change come in your life? Now think about Nicodemus. There's nothing in John chapter 3 that indicates that Nicodemus was saved that night, that he became a follower of Jesus. We don't have that recorded there in the, in the chapter. But we do know that at the end of the gospel of John, however long it is before the end of Jesus' earthly life, Jesus has been crucified. And now Nicodemus shows up again in the gospel story. A man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea came to claim the body of Jesus. Went to to the governor Pilate and said, can I have his body? Pilate released the body of Jesus to, to, to Joseph to take him to prepare him for burial. And the Bible says that Nicodemus was with him and involved in the process of caring for the body of Jesus after his crucifixion. That indicates to me that somewhere along the way something happened in his life. That before he came to Jesus at night, he was afraid and ashamed of being seen with Jesus, and now he is unashamed to be identified with Jesus, with the body of Jesus. Has there been that kind of change happen in your life. Friends, I don't want you to sit in church all of your life and think that that's all that God requires of you. Because remember, you can be just as far from God sitting in a church pew as you are sitting on a bar stool. Have you been born again? Let's bow our heads together.
just quietly where you are there. I want to give you the opportunity to do what you may have never done before. And that is to put your trust in Jesus Christ. To be born again. Right now, would you just quiet your heart before the Lord and say, Jesus, I I know who you are and I've been around you all my life, but I'm not sure I've ever been born again. I, I trust in you for the gift of eternal life. I repent of my sins. Turn my back on my old way of life. I'm not sure I've ever done this before. But I want to be sure today that I've done what you expect of me, and that is simply to believe. And with your heads bowed still, when we begin to sing in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something really bold. And I'm going to ask you just to step out from wherever you are and just come to the front here. We have friends at the front who will be happy to speak with you. And if you'll just come to say, you know, I I wasn't sure, but I prayed that prayer. I put my trust in Christ. What do I do next? And we'll be happy to tell you and show you your new life in Christ. Father, I pray now that as we respond to your word and we worship that you will give friends all over this room freedom to confess Christ publicly. In Jesus' name, amen.